welcome to West Country Wanderings and welcome to my video about the Slad Valley and the famous writer Laurie Lee who wrote the book Side Up With Rosie. I'm not actually at Slad Valley at the moment. I decided to walk to Slad from where I live in the Stroud Valleys further on down in the Seven Vale which of course we'll be familiar with when we do the Seven Vale, the Seven Way even later in the year. But here I'm actually near a farm called Far Westrip Farm and if you're an avid viewer to my channel that was our midpoint when we're doing the Cotswold Way. We're not doing the Cotswold Way today, so I'm making my way towards the village of Randwick, skirting round the field there known as Ocker Hill, down into Ruscombe, White Sill, making my way down into the Slad Valley. So why not join me on Explore here, telling about the life of the writer Laurie Lee. So I've chosen a, well I think it's a good day today, weather-wise. I hadn't originally planned to, to be filming today, it's Friday. In actual fact, I did a canal update. I shot the canal update number six, which will be landing. Not sure if it'll be landing before or after this Laurie Lee video. But uh, yeah, I did, I did that yesterday, really enjoyable. So it was also a nice day, it's even nicer today. Sun out, blue skies, fantastic. Wouldn't think we're in February. It, though it's a little bit chilly this morning, it's now just after 10 o'clock, it's starting to warm up. So uh, yeah, so I don't need my, uh, <laughs> I have got my gloves on because my gloves always get uh, a bit chilly but uh, we're making our way just past skirting around the edge of uh, Far West Strip Farm. In actual fact the Cotswold Way if you want to head south to Bath. You follow the road up here and then turn right dips down into the valley and it makes its way up towards Coley Peak on the Cotswold Escarpments. You've got the escarpment there. Stroud is directly in front of me and if you go the other way up the hill it'll take you back up to Chipping Camden on that wonderful trail but well, as I say we're not doing that today we're heading straight across this field and heading towards Slad so see you in a bit now, I've been wanting to make this video about Laurie Lee and Slad Valley for some time not least of which because as I mentioned in Cotswold Way 11 when we're on the top of Selsley Common looking down in the Slab Valley. I mentioned the fact that I met, I was very fortunate to have met Laurie Lee twice in my life, both obviously when I was much younger, because <laughs> obviously Laurie Lee passed away. Well, I'll give you the exact date and I'll give you his, all the bits about his biography when we get to Slad. But uh, yeah, I was, he left an impression on me in terms of writing and reading. I love a reading, I absolutely love books. Uh, both fiction and also not fiction books about railways and canals, but also I love novels as well. And what I like about that is it immersives, immersive you in a different world. We have lots of things going on with our world at the moment, but it takes you away from all of that. Now, Laurie Lee was a keen walker, and it was on a walk. Well, I met Laurie Lee in actual fact for the second time. I'll tell you about the first time in a minute. But uh, there was a sponsored walk, and I think it was for the Cotswold Ramblers Association. I was at primary school, I was probably only about 10. I was at a primary school in Stroud, just down in the valley there. And we, did, we went on this walk, and it was obviously advertised as being led by Laurie Lee, and he actually led the walk. I think there was about a hundred of us people on the walk. We'll just point this sign out a minute. There it is. <laughs> That's where I started the Cotswold Way back in the summer last year and say so that takes you down in the direction of Bath. I'll show you where the northern bit goes. So yeah we're here at Far West Strip. We did a walk. I think we actually went up to Robra Common from the centre of Stroud. I can't remember, don't ask me how much we raised. So the year would have been, what the year would have been, probably about 1973, 1974, that sort of uh, time. And he was quite engaging because he was leading the walk and I was near the front with him. There was quite a few of us from the school I went to. And he was telling us about different aspects of the views that we were seeing before him. I guess that kind of was stuck and it partially explains I suppose what I'm doing what I'm doing now in showing you the countryside in the area that I, I currently live. And of course obviously I've been showing you parts of Devon and Cornwall where I've been living last year and where obviously I return 
fairly frequently and show you a bit of that as well. But yeah, it was the love of the countryside and nature and landscape. And what he was saying, the way he was so engaging in that, that really, really inspired me. So yeah, just between the stone house and the newer house there is where the Cotswold Way heads up between those two houses, or one cottage, one house, and that makes its way up towards Standish Wood and hence along to Chipping Camden. But uh, I've got uh, Stroud itself to my right now. We're just coming into the, the village of West Trip itself, and then we'll be taking a, a left towards the village of Randwick. Now the hill just behind me is actually called Ocker Hill. Yes, that is correct. I guess it's a bit of uh, Gloucestershire dialect for awkward, but it is official. It is actually marked on the OS map as Ocker Hill. I thought I'd just stop here rather than going up the hill and trying to tell you the rest of the story of my Laurie Lee experience. The village of Randwick is just behind me there. Just ticked away. It's just beautiful uh, landscape here. Just thought it'd be a perfect spot to tell you. First of all, a family connection. My father was very lucky enough and fortunate to grow up in that village of Randwick. It's a stunning village. Obviously it's not the same village it was when he grew up. It's become a lot busier. There's a lot more commuters there. It was obviously a, a greater sense of community in those days and it had uh, more shops and facilities than it has nowadays and people just head into Stroud or the, the bigger towns here about like Gloucester and Cheltenham etc those days it was completely self-enclosed and that was Laurie Lee's experience in Slad too as we'll discuss and come on when we get there but yeah the other reason I wanted to say is my other first meeting with Laurie Lee wasn't on the walk it was actually at primary school when I was at primary school just down the way in Stroud we had a classroom and I don't know if uh, other people can relate to this it had a great big orange circle on the floor and we all used to sit around I can't remember what date it was it'll be an afternoon and the teacher would read us a story and you'd be sat on that orange circle and listening to the teacher and absorbed in the story that they were telling you. Well, one day we had a very special guest to read us a story and that was one Laurie Lee and he read an extract from Sided with Rosie and I'll read part of that extract as we get into Slad later on in the video. But uh, it, it stayed with me. I was absolutely mesmerised the way he he's delivered what he had written all those years ago, but also very close to where he had wrote those words. Yes, if you're not familiar with this part of the world, Stroud, which is the central hub here, is made up of five separate valleys, and I'll try and remember the names of all of them. Is Stonehouse, Nailsworth, and they obviously have two strategic, quite industrial towns come up through the, the wool trade, of course. We also have Painswick, which will be we met when we did the Cotswold Way, and we have Chalford, 
which we did the other day when we were doing the canal walk because the Thames and Severn Canal goes right through Chelford and of course that leaves one more which is Slan. So that's the Painswick Valley behind me. Of course we've got to cross over that now. There's a very busy road, the A46, which I remember from the Cotswold Way as we're heading to Bath. We crossed over it uh, numerous times and yes, you guessed it, we've got to cross over it again to get into the Slad Valley, which is the, the next valley that runs alongside the Painswick Valley here. I've got some steep climbing to do before our final descent into the valley. We're near a place called Hawkwood College and we now need to climb up to Wickridge Hill. So I think I'm at uh, around about 125 metres above sea level and the top of the hill is about 210 metres. Once we get to the top I might have a cup of tea, first break of the walk. Actually I say first break of the walk, I'm well over three quarters of the way there now but I will have a breather at the top before we make our final descent into Laurie Lee's Valley, Slad Valley. So we're at the top of Wickridge Hill, Windridge Hill, I think I think it's called Wickridge I'll put it in the, to the bottom, so I haven't got, looking at my map app at the moment. We're making our final descent now into Slad Valley. Quite an emotional moment this. I've been here by the car before. I've never walked here on foot, and I think this is, what well, it definitely is, the best way to come here to the journey to get to what was Laura Lee's place of birth and also place of death. So who was Laurie Lee? Well, Laurie Lee was born on the 26th of June, 1914, just towards the start of the First World War. He was actually born, not here in Slad, but just a couple of miles further on in the town of Stroud, which I've mentioned a few times. He moved to Slad at the age of three in 1917. And the book, Sided with Rosie, explains exactly how he ended up here in a very vivid description. So what I do is I'm gonna read the introduction to that book to you now. First light. I was set down by the carrier's cart at the age of three. And there, with a sense of bewilderment and terror, my life in the village began. The dune grass amongst which I stood was taller than I was, and I wept I had never been so close to grass before. It towered above me and all around me, each blade tattooed with tiger skins of sunlight. It was knife edged, dark and a wicked green, thick as a forest and alive with grasshoppers that chirped and chattered and leapt through the air like monkeys. Now, despite being brought up in this rural idyll here in the Slan Valley in Gloucestershire, Laurie Lee's early life was far from normal. His father had fought in the First World War, but he didn't actually return to the family home. 
In fact, Lee and his brothers grew up loving the Lights family, the family of their mother, Annie Emily Light, and intensely disliking their Lee relations, his sister Frances Neremiah Joan Lee sadly died in 1915, and he actually describes that in the book in detail, and that left an impression on, them, on him, and she died just at the age of three. He had older siblings from his father's first marriage, namely Dorothy, Harold, Reggie, Phyllis, and Marjorie, and two brothers from his parents' marriage, Jack and Tony. Now it was Jack, Jack Lee, who went on to become a famous film director. I'd drop in a little aside here because I think this is quite an interesting aspect of Laurie Lee's character. Now, when I was 11, I think it was probably 10 actually, 10 and a half, at primary school, we had what was called an 11 plus examination here in Stroud. And I passed the 11 plus and I went on to a school called Marling School. And Jack Lee did exactly the same thing. He passed the 11 plus here in Stroud, or just outside Stroud, and he went to the same school that I did, which was a grammar school. But Laurie Lee didn't pass the 11 plus and he went on to Stroud Technical School. Ironically, later on in the 1960s, Strautech actually merged with Marling School. But because of that, Laurie Lee had this kind of a, a chip on his shoulder that he felt slightly inferior to his brother. There's no reason, of course, why he should do that because both the brothers were extremely talented. Laurie Lee obviously being a really successful writer in his later years, in early years he was a poet. But Jack Lee went on to become a, a well-known name in the film of uh, in the name of film, should I say, in, the, in terms of uh, directors. Uh, he, uh, his, probably his most famous film was the war film Carve Her Name With Pride, which we'll touch on in a later video. In 1931, Laurie Lee came across the White Way colony, just a couple of miles over that way, which was founded by Tolstoyist anarchists. And this exposed him to a different type of political thinking to what he was brought up with in this tight, isolated community in the Slab Valley. Now, in 1933, Laurie Lee met one Sophia Rogers. Now she was an interesting person because she had moved to Slad from, of all places, Buenos Aires. Now this is in the days before people didn't travel all over the world and commute to different places. She traveled all the way from South America to be in Slad. And he had a profound influence on her, not least because of romantic interests, but because of the fact that she taught him some words of Spanish. And because he could speak a few words of Spanish, he then decided to go to Spain. And out of that, of course, he wrote his famous book, As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning. It was during this period that he met a woman called Wilma Gregory, who was to support him financially, because obviously he hadn't yet become a full-time writer and was just doing odd jobs here, here and there. And he was doing his travels in, into Spain as well. In fact, he was later picked up after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in July 1936 by HMS Blanche, a British destroyer from Gibraltar that was collecting marooned British subjects on the southern Spanish coast. Now I have here an anthology of uh, three of Laurie Lee's best known works and the second which of course is the aforementioned As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning and this book was put together in 1995 and Laurie Lee himself put a preface to it and I'll read what he put because it's interesting. Just before the Spanish Civil War I lived in a small fishing village in Andalusia whose mayor has since erected a small monument on the seafront proclaiming that the grand writer Laurie Lee once passed this way and immortalised the town in his work as I walked out one midsummer morning and a rose for winter. I originally concealed the name for the town for political reasons and referred to it as Castillo in the book. Fortunately, that reticence no longer applies and I'm now able to give the town its real names of Alumnicar. Laurie Lee, March 1995.
I'll just read you the introduction to that book because, again, it's very interesting and gives you a context to it. Chapter 1. London Road. The stooping figure of my mother, waist deep in the grass, and caught there like a piece of sheep's wool, was the last I saw of my old country home as I left to discover the world. She stood old and bent at the top of the bank, silently watching me go, one gnarled red hand raised in farewell and blessing, not questioning why I went. At the bend of the road, I looked back again and I saw the gold light die behind her. Then I turned the corner, passed the village school and closed that part of my life forever. The next little piece of story to Laurie Lee gives you a flavour of his kind of bohemian lifestyle because he met Lorna Wishart. Now she was part of what was known as the Bloomsbury Group. Uh, people like uh, Vita Sackville West and uh, also Virginia Woolf, many others of course. And I'll put in the list in some of the others that were in that group. If you want to know more about the Bloomsbury Group, a group of light, uh, very forward-thinking writers. And he actually met her in Cornwall in 1937 and they had an affair. Now, Lorna was actually married at the time as well. And she left him later on for Lucian Freud in 1943. But they had a daughter together, Yasmin David. And Wishart's husband, Ernest, agreed to raise the girl as his own. She later became an artist too. Now it took Laurie Lee some three years to write Side with Rose. In fact, it went under a number of uh, rewrites, but in 1959 it became commercially successful. This enabled Laurie Lee to write full time, and it's still a very well known, very much respected and also it is now set piece for like the examinations for GCSE for literature and it's really well known in schools and I'm really pleased about that because it gives people a flavour of life of what life was really like in this valley here in Slad in Gloucestershire. Now, kind of taking a slice of a piece from his brother Jack which we spoke about earlier in 1951 Laurie Lee was working for the GPO film unit. He actually made documentary films for them. They kind of did publicity type of things. You can actually go back on YouTube and find some of them. They're, wor they're worth a watch actually. It gives you again a slice, slice of the life in the UK in the early 1950s and he wrote scripts for those, presented a couple of them and also was the, the, the chief person behind creating those pieces for the general post office. And fittingly, Laurie Lee in the 1960s returned to his childhood home. He actually bought the cottage because of the money he had from his book Side with Rosie. He could afford now to buy the childhood home. I'll include a photograph of that property now because it is visible from the main road that runs through Slad. That's where he grew up and that's where he lived with his wife throughout the 60s. Laurie Lee died in 1977 and you can visit his grave in the church which is just opposite the pub where he was most famous because it was a short walk away from where he lived and he could often be uh, seen sat outside of her drinking a pint and people would approach him and say are you Laurie Lee and ask him all about his famous book Cider with Rosie. I'll just read you two further ex extracts from Cider with Rosie. One where he talks about the death of his father and mother and also I'll end on a lighter note and a piece that gives you an uplifting feel for this lovely village here in the Cotswolds. Then suddenly our absent father died, cranking his car in a modern suburb and with that his death which was also the death of hope our mother gave up her life. Their long separation had come to an end and it was the coldness of that which killed her. She had raised two families faithfully and alone, had waited 35 years for his praise and through all that time she had clung to one fantasy that aged and broken at last in need he might one day return to her. His death killed that promise and also ended her reason 
the mellow tranquility she had latterly grown forsook her then forever. She became frail, simple-minded, and returned to her youth, to that girlhood which had never known him. She never mentioned him again, but spoke to shades, saw visions, and then she died. We buried her in the village, under the edge of the beechwood, not far from her four-year-old daughter. The day Rosie Burdock decided to take me in hand was a motionless day of summer. Creamy, hazy and amber coloured, with the beech trees standing in heavy sunlight, as though clogged with wild wet honey. It was a time of haymaking, so when we came out of school, Jack and I went to the farm to help. The whir of the mower met us across the stubble. Rabbits jumped like firecrackers about the fields and the hay smelt crisp and sweet. The farmer's men were all hard at work, raking, turning and loading. Tall, whiskered fellows fought the grass, their chests like bramble patches. The air swung with their forks and their swathes took wing and rose like eagles to the tops of the wagons. The farmer gave us a short fork each and we both pitched in with the rest. I stumbled on Rosie behind a haycock and she grinned up at me with the sly glittering eyes of her mother. She wore her tartan frock and cheap brass necklace and her bare legs were brown with hay dust. Get out of there, I said, go on. Rosie had grown and was hefty now and I was terrified of her. In her cat-like eyes and curling mouth, I saw unnatural wisdoms more threatening than anything I could imagine. The last time we'd met, I'd hit her with a cabbage stump. She bore me no grud, she just grinned. I got some up to show you. You push off, I said. I felt dry and dripping, icy hot. Her eyes glinted and I stood rooted. Her face was wrapped in a pulsating haze and her body seemed to flicker with lightning. You thirsty, she said. I ain't so there. You be, she said, come on. So I stuck the fork into the ringing ground and followed her like doom. We went a long way to the bottom of the field where our wagon stood half loaded. Festoons of untrimmed grass hung down like curtains all around it. We crawled underneath between the wheels into a herb scented cave of darkness. Rosie scratched about, turned over a sack and revealed a stone jar of cider. It's cider, she said. You ain't to drink it though. Not much of it at any rate. Huge and squat, the jar lay on the grass like an unexploded bomb. We lifted it up, unscrewed the stopper and smelt the whiff of fermented apples. Well, that's it from West Country Wanderings for today. I hope you enjoyed part one, the walk across the journey to get here to the Slad Valley and part two, where I've told you a little bit about Laurie Lee's life here in the Slad Valley and beyond. If you did enjoy it, please consider a like, a subscribe, maybe tell your friends or family. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what you thought. Until next time on West Country Wanderings, look after yourselves, take care, and I hope to see you all again here very, very soon. Cheers now. Goodbye.